Hey there, I'm Bill and welcome to Project Bill, where today we're going to try and fix this super dead Game Boy. Hey, no spoilers. This video is originally supposed to be a small part of a larger video I'm working on, but this Game Boy ended up being in a lot worse condition than it looks like from the outside, so I decided it warranted its own repair video. That said, let's jump right into it and get to repairing this thing. And I've chosen this because it does not turn on at all. It, it does nothing. And at first glance, it looks to be in pretty decent shape. It even has the battery cover still on it, which is super rare these days. But are, there are some things that have me a little worried about it. So the power switch is pretty clunky and it takes a bit of force to actually move it. And if you look at the back, the screws that hold the shell together have a bit of corrosion on them and it really shouldn't happen under normal conditions. So let's open it up and see what it looks like on the inside. So I'll start by removing the battery cover and then the six tri-point screws holding the back shell on. And at first glance, the power switch is not supposed to be angled like that, and that looks broken. And yeah, it's pretty broken. There's also what looks like melted plastic on the cartridge slot. Maybe someone rested a hot soldering iron there? I removed the three Phillips head screws holding the motherboard to the front shell and undid the two clips holding the ribbon cable for the screen and lifted the motherboard out and away from the cable. First observations are that it's got an obvious issue with the broken switch, but the board overall doesn't seem to be in terrible shape. I'll need to clean it and replace the power switch and then go from there. I began cleaning the board by blowing off any dust with the powered air duster and then I took a soft brush. A kid's toothbrush is perfect for this as it's extra soft and cleaned off all the parts with 99% isopropyl alcohol. For fine wire windings like these, you'll want to be extra careful cleaning as the brush could damage the tiny wires. I continued cleaning the board until I had removed most of the visible dirt and corrosion. I then removed the button membranes and buttons which were pretty dirty and cleaned them with a stiffer brush, being sure to focus on the conductive pads of the button membranes as these are what actually make button presses register. With everything cleaned up, I removed a broken screw stuck in the front shell with some pliers. Now that everything is clean, it's time to replace the power switch. I'll start by masking off the surrounding components with some Kapton tape, which will shield the components from the heat of the soldering iron. Then I added some flux to the four existing solder pins that I need to remove. Flux breaks down the oxidation on the existing solder, helping it to flow. With my iron tinned, I'll use some copper solder wick to remove the existing solder and carefully pry up the old switch as I heat the contact points. I'm using very little force as I pry as I really don't want to lift a pad. You can see this grounding pad here was somewhat damaged already, but thankfully there is enough copper left to still use it. I added some more flux to the two grounding pads and then flowed some solder on those pads. I positioned the new power switch with some tweezers and then soldered it in place. I added some more flux and then worked on soldering the small castellated holes of the switch to the tiny pads of the board. If you're new to soldering, I've linked some resources down in the video description that I found super helpful. I've done a bit of soldering before, but never on anything this small and it took a lot of research before I felt comfortable attempting this. And I accidentally bridged two pins. Some solder wick to clean that up, a bit more trial and error, and hey, that went better than expected. Even though my flux is labeled as no cleaning necessary, I've heard it's always a good idea to clean the flux off with isopropyl alcohol after soldering. With the switch replaced, I put the board back into the back shell, inserted some batteries, flipped the new switch on, and Magic Carp used Splash because nothing happened. Guess that's not too surprising. So we fixed the power switch and it's still not turning on. So what does this mean? Well, it means it's time to get out the multimeter and start testing continuity which is just making sure it's actually a completed circuit. When these two probes touch each other or conduct across something metal like that, we know that the circuit is complete. I've got a working Game Boy here so I can compare it to the yellow one. And if I touch one probe to the positive battery contact and the other to the number three pin on the power switch, there is continuity there, but not at the other two pins. I moved the power switch to the on position and then test it again for continuity. Now I have it at the 3 and C pins, which lets me know which pins I need to focus on on the broken Game Boy. On my broken board, I checked the continuity between the battery positive contact and the 3 pin on the switch, and there's nothing there. As well as nothing at the other 2 pins as expected. I flipped the switch to on, and yep, still nothing. 
From here, I'll use my multimeter and the PCB schematic to see if I can pinpoint where the problem is. Before doing that though, I saw that there is a diode missing here where it says D2. And I don't have this diode on hand, so I'm going to source a replacement from a donor Game Boy Color that has some other significant issues. Remember earlier when I said I didn't want to lift the pad? Well, there's one lifted here, which means there is no copper exposed to actually solder to. This is a bit more of an advanced repair, one that I don't actually know I have the ability to fix, but it's worth a shot. Here's a look at the Game Boy I sourced the diode from, and you can see that there should be two soldered cover pads. So that's what we're looking to get. I scraped off a bit of the corrosion from the upper pad with a metal spudger, and then took a Q-tip soaked in isopropyl alcohol to clean it. I then scraped just below the lower pad to reveal the trace that the pad would have connected to, carefully scraping away the PCB mask until just a tiny bit of the copper trace was exposed. Utilizing the revealed copper trace, I was able to investigate further, and I learned that there was no connection between the positive terminal and the diode. I can test here and see that there is continuity from EM10 here to the diode, so going through EM6 this way is okay, which lets me know that this path here between the positive terminal and EM6 is damaged. And while testing, I accidentally broke the positive battery contact off, and that certainly doesn't help things, so I'll go ahead and replace that. This is a through hole pad, so I added some solder to the front of the board, and I heated the solder there while pulling at what was left of the battery contact on the back. Once that came out, I removed the excess solder with a wick and put on the replacement piece from my donor board, heating the base of it until it slotted into place. I then added some fresh solder back to the connection on the front of the board. With that quick interruption taken care of, I soldered a small wire to the new battery contact and I put this at the base so it won't interfere with the battery compartment. This solder really didn't want to stick to the contact, but I eventually got it to. Then I soldered the other end of that wire to this side of EM6 to restore the power that should flow through this trace. Or at least I thought I did, but I realized just after that I put it on the wrong side as the flow is going towards F1, so I moved the wire to the other side of EM6. Now on to replacing the diode. It took several attempts to get solder to flow to the corroded pad and the trace that I exposed, but after many attempts and lots of flux, I finally got two viable connection points. I'm using a tiny piece of the end of a breadboard wire to extend the trace to the location of the original pad. This was pretty difficult to do as the wire kept sticking to my tweezers, but I eventually got it to seat. The proper way to do this is with a pad repair kit and to apply solder mask ink over that area that was repaired, but I'm just using what I had on hand. With that prepared, I added the replacement diode, orienting it how it was when I took it off the donor board. It's super tiny, but it went on pretty easily. So from here, I tested for continuity from the positive battery contact to this side of F1, and hey, it's now working. Checking from F1 to pin three on the power switch, and there's still not a complete circuit there, so I'll need to run a wire to connect them. And oh look, one of the speaker wires came unattached. Who would have thought? Off camera, I ran the orange wire from F1 to pin three of the power switch, and then reassembled the back cover so I could put the batteries in, and look at that. We have power! Yay! Now that we have power, it was time to test everything else, so I reassembled the Game Boy, replacing the buttons and button membranes, slotted the motherboard into the front shell, then reinserted and locked down the screen ribbon cable. I reinstalled the motherboard screws to hold it together, replaced the plastic power switch, added the rear shell and batteries, and the screen comes on, although it's super dark. And what, what, what just happened? I turned it off and back on, and now it's not powering up. Oh look, another problem. The new power switch sits a bit higher than the original, and the plastic from the original switch doesn't reach high enough to fully contact it, so it's sliding underneath the switch. But that sounds like tomorrow's problem. I'll deal with this later. I mentioned that the screen was really dark. It's possible that the screen is bad, but my hope is that it can be fixed by adjusting the potentiometer that controls the voltage to the screen. So let's try that first. I also tested the Game Boy here a bit, and I noticed that there is no sound and that the start button doesn't work. Yay! There's a small screw located under a piece of tape in the battery compartment, so you can turn it without taking the Game Boy apart. And I took this apart so I could show you. This is where the potentiometer should be. It's, it's not actually broken, it's just missing, which is kind of par for the course for this Game Boy here. Oh. Wait, maybe I found it. Yeah, there it is. Okay, 
So it was there. I wasn't misremembering. It fell off, but yeah, you can see there's there's no screw here. I don't even know how this thing is supposed to work exactly, but this one is definitely very bad and it's not surprising that the screen is showing incorrectly. So I just wanted to take a minute and show where things stand right now. So I did add this potentiometer from a working Game Boy. I wired it onto here. I also added these two wires on the front of the motherboard here. These are kind of like the ones on the back. They're just repairing a broken trace. So this one here is to make the start button work. I was doing some testing. Every, you know, the buttons were working, start button wasn't. So I figured out where it was broken and then jumped it to that point. And then this one here was for the sound. If you look on the back, the EM4 here is completely missing. The pads are torn off and it's just a really tiny repair. I looked it up. It helps to filter out some extra noise through the speaker. It's not actually necessary. So I just jumped it because there was no sound before. And I think that this should make the sound work theoretically. So let me put it back together and let's see where we stand. Okay, so it actually took me a while to put this back together because one of the speaker wires broke while I was assembling it. Go figure. But now it's together. I have the switch on, so I just turn it on by putting the second battery in. So we have power, we have sound, and the game's loaded. Well, that's kind of awesome. I don't know how well you can see it. There we go, we're playing Tetris. I mean, you can see all the buttons where it's just the screen is really, really, really dark and obviously not working correctly. So I gotta look at that. The first thing I wanna do is test if the screen is good or if it's the motherboard. Swap the screen onto a working motherboard here. And, but, well, yeah, I already can see the screen is fine. <laughs> so that's what we want. So if something is wrong with the motherboard, I guess that's not too surprising given how everything else has been. So I figured the place to start with was with the potentiometer. One of the traces there looked bad. So I wired up this breadboard so I could actually actively test things. You see I got power now. And when I hook up, I complete this trace. Look at that. It's no longer super dark. This wire will run from the potentiometer to the rightmost pin of the chip labeled U10 here. So I added some flux and soldered the wire to that pin. I used my multimeter to verify that my solder hadn't bridged over to the middle pin as well. Then I soldered the other end of the wire to the number one pin of the VR2 potentiometer. So I got it put back together. I haven't even tried it yet. I'm really hopeful it's gonna work. And because of that, I wanna share that moment with you all. If it does, let's find out. I think it's working. Oh man, that, that is so awesome. We have successfully saved this Game Boy. So only one last thing to do. We saw earlier that I needed a new power switch, so I 3D printed my own. I found a 3D model for the existing switch and I edited it to extend the plastic tabs higher so they contact the new power switch. So is this project worth it? In terms of the time and effort spent, no. No way. This took a lot of time to repair, and you can find Game Boy Colors in good condition for around $50 or so. But was it worth it to me? Absolutely. I learned a ton about small electronics and greatly improved my soldering abilities, which is going to help me with some upcoming projects I have in mind. Plus, it was just super fun to see if I could repair this thing and give it new life. I hope that you liked the video, and maybe some of what I did can help you fix your old Game Boy. If you do fix one or have comments on how I can improve my soldering, let me know down in the comments. Until next time, go fix a Game Boy.